Dear smartphone companies, carrying on from my video on the frankly abysmal naming of smartphones, welcome to eight more things that I really think they would benefit from. Number eight, there is such thing as launching too many models. If you imagine all smartphone users together as this massive pool of people here, then you can see how launching multiple phones can make sense. If each has a different selling point, it does allow a company to appeal to as much of this pool as possible. But the issue is that the more phones you launch, the more these phones are gonna overlap with each other. And what that means for customers is confusion. Each individual model loses memorability and significance. And just the fact that your company now has to scatter their support across so many different phones means that by its very nature, that support is gonna be less good. Samsung is pretty guilty of this. They released approximately 40 smartphones in 2019 alone, and to someone who isn't in the know, this lineup is almost impossible to navigate. Take the Galaxy Note series. It used to be one phone, and it would be the best phone the company makes, full stop. If you bought a Note phone, you could rest easy, knowing that you'd bought one of the most powerful mobile devices out there. But then, in 2019, Samsung went from making one Note phone to making four different variants, and to top it all off, a fifth one a few months later, which actually had very little to do with the other four phones in the lineup. These aren't bad phones, just confusing ones. And confusion is one thing, but more importantly is just this splitting of resources that has to happen then. Instead of focused companies like OnePlus that provide every model of their phones with pretty much three years of guaranteed updates, Samsung has developed a bit of a reputation for giving just one to a lot of its mid-range phones. And that too, delivering them as late as four months after some other companies. Apple uses this concept, but to its advantage. They focus their efforts on a tiny number of models each year, which means yes, they give up being able to appeal to everyone, but the upside is that people can at least keep track of the current iPhone lineup at any given time, and that Apple can afford to keep each of these phones up to date for five whole years after launch. Number seven, avoid price cuts. As customers, we love the concept of a price cut, the idea of paying less for something that's worth more. However, whilst putting a phone on sale will sell more units in the short term, price cuts become a bit of a trap for companies. One of LG's biggest failings was that they would launch a phone at one price, let's say $900, and then just four months in, it would be on sale for half the price. Now, that might sound great. People will buy, thinking that they've got a bargain getting this phone at $400, but over time, as this pattern repeats itself, nobody's gonna want to pay the full $900 for the phone. LG has implicitly devalued their own products. And this is why Apple launches at one price and sticks with it for the whole year. It doesn't even matter if your phone is not initially making a whole lot of profit because over the course of that year, the cost of production will keep falling as components get cheaper. You might know, if you've ever tried to sell an old iPhone, that they retain their value far better than Android equivalents. And this lack of price cuts on Apple's end is part of the reason why. Number six is hyper-competitive marketing. The last few years have seen smartphone companies getting smarter, sneakier, and social media is playing a bigger role than ever in driving hype. But some companies just take it too far. It's one thing to build a great product and then to create adverts that showcase how good it is. But a lot of the marketing that I see now has boiled down to, hey, you, your smartphone is not good enough, buy ours instead. And this ultra competitive behavior can come across as a bit petty. While teasing their new X2 smartphone with a 120 hertz display, Xiaomi's Poco brand created a website that checked the refresh rate on your current screen and basically found some way to tell you it sucked. If you had a standard 60 hertz refresh rate, it literally shames you, asking you how you feel to be using a technology that's two decades old. Like, ouch. And even if you have a 120 hertz refresh rate phone, it then asks you whether you feel good about having spent too much money on it. Another example would be the VP of Xiaomi publicly calling out another company as a copycat. Whether or not it's true is not really important. You want to come across like you couldn't care less what other brands are doing because your product is so good that you don't need to retaliate, it doesn't matter. And the worst part of this hyper-competitive marketing is so many times companies can't hold themselves to it. They'll make such bold claims that they literally end up eating their own words a year later. Think of the number of companies that use Apple's removal of a headphone jack to make a quick joke, only then to follow suit with that exact same move in their own next model. Or the companies who made fun of others for being too expensive, only to then start dialing up the prices of their own phones. Even this upcoming Poco phone that's ridiculing the displays of other phones, it's only a matter of time before Xiaomi eventually releases another normal two-decade-old 60 hertz display phone. And so really they're just gonna end up making fun of themselves.
themselves. I'm not saying Apple makes some sort of otherworldly smartphone, they don't, but their marketing is fantastic. That's the reason that in 2019, even though they shipped less than 15% of global smartphone units, they made over 60% of global smartphone profits. They practically pretend other brands don't exist in their trailers and their videos, and that makes their phones come across as being incomparable, and that's a profitable strategy. Number five, a phone in 2020 needs to have not just a good screen, good battery, good camera, but also a set of other services and products surrounding it, an ecosystem. The way I think about it is this, almost every single person that buys a smartphone has an already existing tech ecosystem. The computer and the earphones they already have, as well as the products their friends and family use. There are many phone companies, like OnePlus, who offer a smartphone that fits nicely into your existing product lineup. But even better would be a phone that can not just fit, but complement the tech products you already own. And Samsung is one of the few Android companies I could see running with this idea. Android users are pining for a feature that allows them to send stuff as simply as Apple's AirDrop can, and Samsung is finally delivering with something called QuickShare. But imagine if this could work between not just Samsung phones, but also Samsung phones and your Windows laptop. That would be a killer feature, and I reckon it's coming. Samsung recently announced a partnership with Microsoft, which I reckon means Samsung will start to gain exclusive tie-in features with Windows. And the opportunities are endless here, but just as an example, what if you could use your Galaxy Note smartphone as a literal stylus input for your computer. Instead of spending $200 on a drawing slate, if this phone can replicate that functionality, it drastically improves the value proposition of buying Samsung phones. Samsung's already got their own Galaxy Buds earphones, and their own set of laptops and tablets too. So if they really push these to make them fantastic standalone products in their own categories, and then make sure that those work really well with their phones, then they're drastically increasing the value of all of their products together. Now, number four. If you are going to give your phone a regional variant, then do do it wholeheartedly. Many Chinese companies, for example, create both a China version of their phones and an international version. Xiaomi last year came out with the Redmi K20, and this was a brilliant phone, but then confusingly, a few months later, released the exact same device in the West, but labeled as the Xiaomi Mi 9T. As it is, this in itself is already a puzzling move. You've got to remember, we're living in the age of the internet. Even though this Redmi K20 was only intended for Asian markets, this is the phone everyone ended up reviewing and talking about. And so when they eventually re-released it as the Mi 9T, the biggest thing I saw people talk about with it was, haven't I seen this before? The point I wanted to make here is related to this. It's that if a company is going to create regional variants, then it would be great to see the software being tailored to Western taste, and not just the name. Because let's face it, different parts of the world have different requirements. There are so many times when I come really close to recommending someone from the West a Chinese brand smartphone, because a lot of them are great value, but then I stop myself because I'm not sure they'll like the software. For example, image processing because of cultural norms in China, a lot of Chinese phones are built around processing images in a way that smooths skin, adds saturation, and makes your eyes look brighter than they actually are, even if you turn all beauty modes off. It doesn't mean these images are bad, and in fact, on a technical level, I would say the camera hardware in Xiaomi and Huawei's phones is some of the best on the market. But just the way the images are tuned makes me personally prefer daytime shots on Samsung or Apple's phones. Even just the way the user interface looks. When you're releasing a product in a foreign country, it's important that it feels native and familiar to people there. So instead of using the exact same software skin that originated from China, it would be great to see something that aligns better with what Android users want to see here. Samsung is a company that's actually done this really well. They're a Korean firm, but customers in the UK and US feel right at home on a Samsung device. Next up pay attention to haptics. Haptics are the simulated sense of touch you get on smartphones that use small vibration motors on the inside. And this might not seem important on the face of it, but it's a massive part of what makes premium phones feel premium. I can't even list the number of times I've picked up a three to $500 phone, started using it, been really impressed by the display, the camera, the build quality, only then to start typing and feeling this mushy whirring happening under the screen. Good quality haptics don't show up on a spec sheet, so I can see why companies prefer to save some money and go cheap here. But long term, just by spending an extra $6 per unit, a smartphone company can make a transformational difference to the quality of the experience. Number two, the future is matte or maybe textured. 
You see, glass is a relatively good material for use on the back of a smartphone. It feels quality, and unlike a metal back, doesn't interfere with wireless charging. But just leaving glass as it is has its caveats. Glossy glass shows fingerprints like crazy, and from my experience, swings wildly between being a sticky surface and then a worryingly slippery surface. I would say OnePlus has come to a nice compromise with the matte coating they put on their glass smartphones. And to be honest, the absolute best I felt was the backs of the new iPhone 11 Pros. And let's be honest, now that Apple has done it, we're probably about to see a lot more of it from other companies, but I'm not complaining, I can't wait for that. The one other really interesting example was the emerald green coloured Huawei Mate 30 Pro. Huawei used a textured matte finish towards the base of the phone where you would grip it, which slowly transitioned into glossy at the top. I think it's a great idea. And linked to this, it would be amazing to see a flagship smartphone that can safely be used without a case. You know, one that doesn't look like this. Surveys that have been done in the US show that literally 80% of smartphone users don't feel comfortable without a case. That stat is probably the highest of any product group in existence. If phone makers could use some of the more advanced technologies we see in cases to bake protective components into the design of a phone, then they can make sure that the end product still feels premium. They'll have control over how end users experience their products, as opposed to leaving it up to $2 case sellers on Amazon. And the protection wouldn't need to be crazy. Just a subtly placed rubber ring around the camera module or do wonders, for example, or four little padded dots in each corner of the back. That would be so much better than feeling this constant need to cover up the back of your phone with what is effectively a glorified plastic sheet. Now for number one. We're in the year 2020. Why does call quality still suck? I've lost count of the number of times I've been on a call and it either sounds horrible, it cuts off randomly, or those times when it has just enough lag that instead of feeling like you're having a conversation with someone, you feel like you're playing a game of trying to time words correctly. Modern smartphones try to address this with multiple microphones and noise reduction algorithms. These help, of course, but the very nature of an algorithm means it can't filter out unexpected sounds like people talking around you, only the monotone ones like a leaf blower. And then, even if your phone can record your voice properly, that audio is compressed to be sent through traditional voice networks in real time, and this is often an even bigger choke point. Phone companies have come up with technologies like HD Voice and VoLTE, and to be fair, VoLTE in particular has potential. It uses LTE networks to send your voice instead of traditional voice networks, and that's an improvement, but it's still not great. We're in an age where we can stream 1080p Netflix shows over data and play complex online multiplayer games, but it's just bizarre that calling is where we draw the line. So what can phone companies do? There's a few options. So A would be to work directly with Qualcomm, for example, the company that makes the communication chips inside of a lot of our phones. Just work with them to build a phone that has the best possible signal reliability and signal strength. This might involve using less metal or different types of materials on the back and using more antennae inside for consistency. Samsung actually does this quite well and generally speaking, Samsung phones score towards the top in terms of signal consistency. Or option B would be to develop a software solution that either doesn't compress your voice as much or compresses it in a way that doesn't damage it as much. Most internet connections now are more than fast enough to have crystal clear phone conversation. And if someone can release a smartphone that could guarantee reliable call quality, I'd be willing to overlook a lot just to use it. Obviously, a phone company like Samsung, they can't redesign the entire phone infrastructure themselves. But what they could do is build a calling app just for Samsungs. It could be tuned from the ground up to take advantage of where Samsung has placed their microphones and the types of antenna they use. They could definitely build something that was better than using a generic app that's built to work on every device. And that's me done for now. Let me know if there's anything you would add to this list. And if you haven't already seen it, do check out the first episode of Dear Smartphone Companies. I think you'll like it. And with that being said, my name is Aaron, this is Mr. Who's the Boss, and I'll catch you in the next one.